Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about immigration. Our guest, Ernesto Castaneda, is director of the Center for Latin American and Latino Studies, the Immigration Lab, and the Master's in Sociology, Research, and Practice at American University in Washington, D.C. Ernesto Castaneda, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much, David. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for what you've been doing and writing on this topic. What uh, what has changed recently in U.S. immigration policy? A lot. Actually, there's been a lot of changes in immigration policy at the executive level or at the on the ground uh, in the way that Border Patrol carries out their work. There hasn't been a major legislative change or an immigration reform, as people have been calling from the center, from the left, from the right for a long time, uh, for many decades. So there's been piecemeal programs that have tried to band-aid some of the uh, bad uh, consequences created by the lack of clear federal laws regarding immigration. So we have the continuation of these 10 million people who have been in limbo for over 10 years, many of them, the majority of them. Uh, this figure of the 10, 11 million is an estimation, but it keeps constant uh, for, um, for many reasons. One of them is that uh, many people find ways to become um, regularized. Uh, it's hard, uh, but many others just leave, just retire, go back to the countries of origin uh, or, or become elderly and pass away. So even though new people keep coming, even, those, even some of them undocumented, uh, is not contrary to what, what, what one could imagine, is not that the undocumented uh, population is swelling. So that's one thing, the concern though about it, the undocumented immigration continues. And again, the specter of the, the Mexican laborer, uh, middle-aged man, now the Fox News says of military age, although they are coming here to work, not to wage war. Um, that, that specter continues. But the big changes are happening in the ground. Now, uh, Mexican migration has been going down since 2008, uh, the Great Recession, because of demographic changes in Mexico and other things that we can talk about. Um, then the migration became largely from Central America. In 2014, there was a big uh, attention in the media about unaccompanied minors, particularly from El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Honduras, connected still to the civil wars in the 1980s that were supported directly and indirectly by the U.S. So a lot of families were reunifying uh, legally or not. Uh, so we see that. But in the, in the last few years, we see people coming fleeing the wars in Ukraine, uh, the withdrawal uh, of the U.S. in Afghanistan, uh, as well as the effects of the pandemic and the economic crisis in, in Cuba, in Nicaragua, in Venezuela. So we see a lot of people coming here, also escaping uh, organized crime in, in the Americas, and they come asking for asylum. So they turn themselves in. So even though uh, many presidents have built walls and fences uh, on their national law and international treaties, people can come in the airport, in ports of entry, or at the wall and ask for asylum. So the latest changes in policies has been President Biden uh, now saying that for the first time, uh, there will be a quota of how many people can ask for asylum in a given day. And if the number surpasses 2,500 for seven days, that he would close the border, meaning he wouldn't tram it, he wouldn't allow the federal government to process any more asylum-seeking applications of people arriving at the border and asking uh, proactively for that process to stop. Why would President Biden choose to go after people who are openly approaching the U.S. authorities and asking for salvation from catastrophes, from wars and famines and so forth, rather than the people who get all the blame and criticism and demonization, the people who are trying to sneak in? Why, why that choice? That's a very good question. And that's a question that people should be asking. Um, unfortunately, I think the, the reasons I think are two. The one of it is political. Uh, he thinks that if he seems tough on the asylum seekers, it would help him in his relation campaign. Because although people are coming legally with good reasons and they're going to start the process of asylum, and if they cannot prove that indeed they are escaping violence and other things, they can be deported, they will be deported. Many are. They are lining up uh, outside of, of our walls and doors, outside of hotels in cities like New York. 
So they make for very bad images of literally people sleeping in the streets in New York, temporarily in El Paso, outside of the border. So it, it, some people say that it creates an, um, an image of chaos at the border and disorder, and that it makes him look like, like the U.S. is invaded and all that. So he's trying to change that image by this performative act of, oh, no, I'm being tough, and I'm going to limit even uh, asylum. So I think that's kind of the advice he's getting, which is bad advice, because people are not going to forget those images, and people who are going to vote for Trump are not going to suddenly vote for Biden because he did this uh, very Trump-like, very... Uh, anti-asylum uh, immigration law. So it's not working, but I think there's a, a bad political calculation on, on one end. On the second end, I think that uh, indeed the, 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 the big change is that less people are, are, are wanting to sneak in because if you sneak in, yes, you can come in, you can reunite with your family, you can get a job, but then you will be undocumented for a long time without any political rights. You cannot visit in your country of origin, you cannot bring your family members legally. There's a lot of cost of being undocumented in the US, human, physical, economic, et cetera. So I think people don't wanna do that in, in a way. The other one is that we see a lot of populations that are coming for the first time. Venezuelans, for example, they don't have the networks of family members that can welcome them in their apartments, that can connect them to a job in a, in a under the table fashion. So they are coming and they're asking for, uh, they're seeing the US as an ally country that can help them uh, escaping the, what they see as, as a, the dictatorship of Maduro, and they think the U.S. is going to uh, um, open their arms to welcome them. Um, so, so, so the people that are that are apprehended have actually decreased. We have less people being apprehended by the border patrol because more people are turning themselves in. So they are encountered; they can be counted, uh, and that's where a lot of the resources of the border patrol have gone in processing uh, cases of asylum. The the people that are being brought in by coyotes and guys through the desert. Uh, it still exists, but it's a much slow, slower numbers. And there's more technology than ever. So there's drones, there's a lot of border patrol. There's a lot of money that has been spent on that. And it, and it more or less works. Uh, and a lot of people uh, died in the desert trying to cross, which was a way to deter people. So that's an old war that was fought. Uh, but again, what the US didn't expect is that many people will come willingly turning themselves in. So it's easier to address those populations that are in front of you that you can count than try to um, find people that are more and more sophisticated when they cross the border through tunnels or through new mechanisms that every time you put more enforcement and every time you close a, a legal avenue to come to the US, you're gonna be pushing some people to do this subterraneous uh, travel that each time becomes more, more expensive, more dangerous for the people doing it. And it, yeah, and it becomes more of a business for the people actually managing that type of travel. It seems to me, Ernesto Castaneda, in U.S. politics, that everyone pays a lot of attention to what candidates promise they will do or pretend they will do with almost a universal acceptance that it's just a pretense. And the minute the election is over and the candidate is in office, everybody forgets what was promised. So I don't remember four years ago, Joe Biden, the candidate, promising to limit asylum seekers. I remember him promising to stop separating families and end the cruel treatments of the Trump administration. Do you remember what he promised and how, how has he come through on what he promised last time? Indeed, yes. Uh, what was very particular of the last election uh, in, in 2020 was that there was a clear contrast that Biden and Democrats were making between Republican immigration policies and the Trump very cool policies, more uh, clearly the uh, family separation at the border that was intentionally done from Trump. There was so much a backlash that even Trump kind of rescinded that executive order uh, and, and stopped implementing that policy after some weeks. Um, and so Biden and the Democrats campaign of not doing that ever again, they have not. They were also very critical of what was called then the asylum ban that uh, Trump tried in many ways to stop people coming from Muslim majority countries from selling in or arriving or asking for asylum in the US. The courts keep deeming it uh, unconstitutional. Finally, it was a version of that was passed. When Biden came into office, he got rid of that. Um, but Biden was very critical of, of Trump's um, attempts to not respect the right of asylum. So now he's he's contradicting himself and going backwards in, in the protection of asylum rights. Um, but also uh, Biden ended, he took a while, 
but he ended Title 42, which we was which he was critical of from the uh, Trump administration. Um, he he got rid of that program, and then um, and he didn't pay any any political cost for being pro immigrant in his policies. So it's a mistake that by being anti that being pro immigrant it would cost him politically or or vice versa that becoming suddenly anti immigrant he would do it. And let me just add uh, uh, vice versa. The Trump administration in, in 2016, Trump promised to build a wall. Very little of that wall was being built. Was built. Um, he promised a lot of deportations. There were less deportations during Trump than during the Obama administration. One could say that in the last years, Biden has deported more people than Trump did. So also Trump now is saying that if he came into power again, he would deport, he'll do a massive deportation of, of people here undocumented. That would be extremely costly. You need almost a totalitarian regime to do that, and it would affect uh, citizens, spouses, children who are citizens, employers. It will create an economic um, um, a recession. Uh, it's something that is easy to see in the campaign. He didn't do it, and I don't think there's any basis to think he would do it again. All this seems to be very popular with the with conservatives and Republicans. This idea of massive deportations. I wonder if there's anyone in the United States who has not been deported who knows that. Obama and Biden deported more people than Trump, because clearly Trump has the image of being the one who's in favor of deportations, even if Biden and, and Obama are the ones who do more of it. Um, why, why would Biden think he needs the Trump image? Why would he think he need, didn't he get elected by pretending to be Bernie Sanders, not by pretending to be Donald Trump? Absolutely. Not only did he get elected uh, pretending to be Bernie Sanders, but he has been a very successful president, uh, recovering the economy in record time, uh, cutting unemployment by doing very uh, aggressive, one could say from U.S. standards, public program um, spending, uh, all the support that families got during the pandemic. So the, the Bernie Sanders, uh, Elizabeth Warren policies uh, became very successful when implemented by Biden and uncontroversial. People are not criticizing them. I think um, uh, the economy has to, uh, the, the economic crisis is not a topic in the campaign because we're out of it. Inflation, it's, it's an issue and people talk about it and rightly so, but it's not something unique to the US. So, uh, and, and same thing in the, in the migration aspect, he ran it in a very pro-immigrant way. He, um, he didn't deliver anything further for DACA recipients. He didn't really advance any serious conversations on uh, uh, comprehensive immigration reform, uh, even though he said that during the campaign, he didn't create any new avenues to legalize the status of the 10 million. Uh, and, and I think he's, he's far, far of it is the Congress divided and not having a lot, enough votes in the Senate to do something like that. And the other one that uh, Susan Rice and other uh, White House former uh, advisors uh, told him that immigration was very political and that he he shouldn't touch it if he wanted to be reelected. So I think that was an unfortunate thing. Uh, a lot of effort was put instead into the infrastructure, so a little bit of healthcare, a little bit of other very successful bipartisan bills that are very large in terms of budget and, and what they do for the U.S. economy. Uh, but immigration is something that after being elected, he has him touch in, in the sense of regularizing people. Um, but uh, let me just add that he has been very successful in starting new policy projects that are on the right, going on the right direction. Uh, and they are pilot projects, and they are not they don't come with a lot of funding because they are not supported by the Congress. Uh, but uh, could 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 put good um, good examples for future immigration policy. A couple of examples. Uh, one of them is at the end of Title Forty Two in May of last year. He, for example, allowed in that legislature that if people were coming from Cuba, Haiti, um, Nicaragua, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, those four countries, people could come, if they have a sponsor here, they could come basically legally asking for asylum to the ports of entry, and they wouldn't be counted in this quota that he just announced. So recognizing the tough circumstances in Haiti and other other countries basically created an open door for them, for some of them. Same thing with Ukraine. It was basically an open door to people escaping from Ukraine. Very little uh, backlash or criticism of that from any party. Uh, no political press about that. Uh, Biden has also started a, a Obama pilot. He has expanded it, of, uh, opening offices in Guatemala, in Colombia, and other countries 
where people from those countries or neighboring countries can go to a, to a U.S. office and say, hey, I'm escaping persecution. I would like to get a visa to travel to the U.S. legally by airplane to ask for asylum. And that's happening. Small numbers, but that's working, and that's better than crossing the Darien jungle or crossing Mexico and, and here and um, risking your life. This is something that should be expanded once they have the resources. Another example is CBP-1, an app when people can use in Mexico to get an appointment to, to present the asylum claims. Uh, there's problems with the app. It's not, um, there's a lot of technical issues. It doesn't produce enough appointments per day. But for the people that are able to get their appointment and get safely into the border, which is not an easy thing, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a step forward. So these are little things that have made um, the, the arrival at the border more orderly and more humane, uh, kind of quiet. And the public doesn't understand, but for immigrants who are able to benefit from that, it's a life-changing thing. The problem is that not all immigrants are able to, to, to use that right now because there was a bottleneck because of the pandemic. And then administratively, there's not enough resources and personnel to tramit all the as as asylum, asylum um, claims of the people arriving at the border. Why, why do people come? It seems that some come from countries that have been militarized by the U.S. military, and some come from countries that are being economically sanctioned by the U.S. government. Are there policies that would actually help people be happier where they are? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, people don't want to migrate. Kamala Harris said in Central America, some people made fun of her, but that is true. She wasn't telling not to come, but it's nice when people don't have to come if they don't want to. If you fall in love with somebody, you want to study abroad, you want to start a business, a few people that come mainly legally, they could continue to do it. But 97% of the world population lives in the country that they were born in. So it's not that people decide to, I don't want to see my father ever again or my mother. I'm going to leave my friends behind and my cousins, and I'm just going to leave and, and become undocumented in Europe and, and not come back to my country until 30, 40 years into the future. That's not an easy decision, especially when you have to leave your children behind because you don't want to risk them in the in the tree, like a lot of immigrants do from many countries. So you're right. If one looks at where more, many immigrants have come to the U.S. in the last few decades, it was uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, more recently Iraq, Afghanistan, Central America, um, again, Afghanistan. So again, countries when there was a, a strong U.S. presence in one way or another uh, uh, because of warfare. So there's a, a, a direct link. What, what, where do people go to um, from North Africa? Well, it depends on what conditions they have or what history they have. So in France, we have people from Algeria, from uh, of Morocco, that used to be a colony of, of France. Uh, so it's not random where people go to. That's why we have a lot of Indians and Pakistanis and Bangladeshis going into England because they were part of the empire. So these um, foreign excursions of European and and North American forces and societies, they create a two-way pathway. So, uh, so yes, a lot of migration, when people don't like it, you could say that it's an after effect of, of foreign intervention. There's even this phrase that some um, scholars and immigrants uh, use that say, we are here, uh, meaning immigrants in the, in the global north, because you were there, because there was an intervention, military or economic. So these things are not uh, unentangled uh, in this. What, what would be wrong with just letting people come and go, with not having a border, with not having the chaos and the militarization and the walls of the border? Because there isn't any, uh, you know, there's no idea that can stay out. There's, you know, there's, there's just people who look different who can be kept out. But uh, what would be wrong with, with getting rid of the whole thing? That's a, that's, a, that's a very good question, and that's that's a question that people should ask themselves because it, it, it leads us to very, very nice uh, conclusions and answers. Again, it's a fact that people don't want to leave home unless they have to. Persecution, even, even poverty and famine is not enough because the poorest of the poor don't have the resources to travel borders and to bring money with them to buy food along the way, to pay, to pay a guy. So poverty itself doesn't cre create a lot of international long-distance migration. Uh, if anything, people will migrate within a country to a city or something like that. So if you open borders, what happens is that some people choose to move and some people don't choose to move. But it will be actually very similar to the numbers we have right now. Why do I say that? For example, the European Union, uh, changing, changing regions. So if you are Spanish or French or Italian, for many years now, uh, citizens from many of those countries couldn't move legally 
freely anytime they want to get a job in another country within Europe. It happens very rarely. It's a small percentage of the Europeans who choose to move to another country. The ones that were migrating more were the, the English going, for example, retire in the south of Spain or Portugal, and, uh, and some people going to England for work. With Brexit, uh, we see that the immigration between Europeans from the continent and, and, and the UK has in this decrease. A lot of people from England have left uh, the, the UK for better opportunities in continental Europe or America. Um, but we see that actually, um, although it's less in the media and people are less concerned about immigration, immigration from the rest of the world into England has decreased, has, sorry, has increased after Brexit. So again, another contradiction about what right-wing politicians say and what they do. Once there's a lot of research showing that politicians either from the left or, or the right in Europe and the US historically, once they are in office, the policies they implement are very similar. Although public perception is very different. They see the conservatives as strong in immigration and the liberals as weak. But in, in reality, there's a lot of trade. There's a lot of people moving uh, places. Another good example is the US, right? The 50 uh, continental states or Hawaii and Puerto Rico, they are open borders. People can move back and forth. Uh, but we see that we have historic low levels of people moving within the US, especially people with less than a high school education are refusing to leave the counties where they were born. And they, more than ever, people die from very few, or sorry, very, uh, a lot of people in the US today live between very few miles of where their mother lives. Uh, so somebody born in Montana, in Idaho, in North, uh, North Dakota, even though they could get better opportunities in Oregon or in Florida or in Texas, they decide not to move. They want to stay where they are, and that's their right. Um, but then people that go to that already move for college, for graduate education, uh, or international migrants, they are more willing to move state from state looking for job opportunities. So the U.S. has for a long time grown and, and depended on that social mobility within the U.S. of people moving in states. I live in five states in, in my 20 years in the U.S. And that's something very common for half of the U.S. population. But the other half is very, is very sedimentary, even though they have open borders. So yes, if we open borders completely, the, the, the difference in how many people migrate would be mar very marginal. A lot of lives will be saved. A lot of money will be saved. Um, the only, the only uh, promise to that is that the, 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 the people making millions of dollars on border technology or militarization, people having a job as a border patrol, one of the few ways to be a middle class professional in El Paso, Texas, even if you are an immigrant, is the border patrol. Those jobs will disappear. Uh, but other jobs could, could, could come from, from, from international investment for migration, etc. And then the, the, the most uh, dangerous thing here is an idea, the idea of the nation state, that uh, countries have um, a people that share a culture and a race, and, and that those people should have their own, co their own government that represents them because they share the same blood. That's an idea that comes with the French Revolution that has never been the case in most places in history. Um, the Germans tried it in World War II. It didn't work really well. And in the U.S., we have always come from very different parts of the world. Uh, but we share a common political project, a common culture, a common, a, a common destiny, and it's worked really well. But this idea that we want to have a country for people from that country, it's very dangerous and still part of that way we think, the way things are taught in school, that, that, that borders represent a culture. And once you cross the Canadian border, things are completely different. And once you're in the U.S., it's a different world. Well, there's a lot of similarities between Canadians and Americans, for example. I think, Ernesto Castaneda, that uh, if we got rid of borders around the United States, you would eventually see some damage to the idea of the nation state. But I think you would even more quickly see another change, which would be the disappearance of the fear of mass immigration because it wasn't happening. And, and I think that when people say that what they're what what really drives them toward these cruel policies is that somebody has broken a law. It's very hard for me to believe that when Trump and Biden break laws all the time and Trump is a convicted felon and nobody cares. I don't think that's what drives the cruelty. I think it's racism. And uh, I, I don't know. Do you am I wrong? Is there evidence? Do we know what what drives the current policies? Because the Democrats and, and President Joe Biden claim that their difference is that they're not racist. They, they support genocides and wars around the world, but 
not not while saying racist things and that's the difference between them and the republicans right right but, but historically uh, and in many countries but in the u.s there's a lot of clear uh for example in, in in a book that i have called building walls it's about how it's not only building the the, the bricks the, the 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 physical wall in the u.s mexico border it's over 200 years of discourse of difference that Mexicans are some type of human and Americans are a different one. Even though that there's a lot of mixture, a lot of uh, interchange, a lot of, there's been uh, Latinos in the US before the US became a country. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of speeches in Congress where Congress people, congressmen, uh, very openly say that they wanna keep uh, America uh, a white country. Uh, it was in the constitution of California and, and other states in the West when they were formed that they were formed as uh, as white states, uh, states for whites only. When you have um, Chinese Exclusion Act made on racial, cultural basis. So there's a lot of historical examples when this was very clear. And right now, uh, it's more the the, the, the the Republican base, the MAGA base, that, that has really an international project when they want uh, to make America great again. It's, it's a code um, for keeping America white. And, and because uh, Trump talks often against immigrants, but he's married to an immigrant from Eastern Europe, there's no problem there, right? Uh, his mom is from Scotland, never an issue. His grandfather is from Germany, it's never an issue. And he says openly, right, how can we have more immigrants? How can we not have more immigrants from Sweden, from these beautiful countries? And we have uh, people from these uh, uh, whole countries, uh, talking about the Caribbean, talking about Mexican, South Americans. So he's making it clearly a racial thing. Um, that he doesn't want America to stop being white. Again, under, forgetting the history, where at one point in, in U.S. history, uh, to be German was to be an American, right? Was not to be Anglo-Saxon. They were speaking a foreign language. They were a threat to the country. Same thing went to Italians, to Irish, which now are part of the white uh, mainstream culture of the U.S. And that will happen with many, many other groups in the future. Um, but yeah, there's, there's this uh, fear about the changing demographics, some people say, the changing nature, the culture of the U.S. that is overblown, but it is indeed part of, um, again, people, the white nationalists that support Trump, it's a very a very racial-based kind of white supremacist project, and they grad about it, right? They grad about how immigration is a problem, the, the theory of uh, the great replacement that uh, use or other minorities are going to take over politically and the power from whites as a, as a, as a cabal, as a the conspiracy uh, that again is not unique to the U.S. It's something that is happening in Europe, and there's people uh, talking internationally to to spread these ideas. Um, but it's it's very it's, it's it's untrue, and it's very dangerous. But some people uh, believe it and are willing to to go to extreme violent means. We've been speaking with Ernesto Castañeda, who is director of the Center for Latin American and Latino Studies, the Immigration Lab, and the Masters in Sociology Research and Practice at American University in Washington, D.C. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.